It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, people in this province should expect quality health care that's available when they need it. But under this government, we're seeing critical services disappearing from communities. Emergency department closures are happening more frequently, and they are staying closed longer. A new report from the Ontario Health Coalition reported a staggering 868 emergency department closures this year alone. So, Speaker, through you to the Premier, what possible explanation can this government offer to Ontarians who lost over 30,000 hours of emergency care this year? To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I've said many times that when individual hospitals have to make a very challenging decision based on the health human resources that they have available to them to temporarily close for an hour or a shift, uh, a, a, a part of their operation, it is disruptive for community. But that is exactly why our government has made such a conscious effort and investments in our hospital systems, in our health human resources, expanding the number of nurses that are training in the province of Ontario, expanding the number of residency positions that are available for physicians in Ontario. We'll continue to do that work and we'll continue to expand the health human resources because we know how important it is to the people of Ontario. Here, here. Supplementary question. Speaker, Speaker, the minister can try to spin this any way she wants. She can try to downplay it, but the reality is very different. The Ontario Health Coalition blames these closures on, and I'm going to quote them, unprecedented failure of leadership by this government. Oh, Folks in Huron. Perth and Wellington are experiencing multiple simultaneous closures. Durham had 51 closures this year alone. People in Clinton haven't had reliable access to an ER since 2019. Speaker, the holiday season is one of the busiest times for local hospitals and emergency rooms. What is this Premier going to do to stop emergency department closures over the holidays? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. What we will continue to do is work with our hospital partners, invest, ensuring that we have alternative payment plans so that physicians have the opportunity to practice in those underserviced areas. We have a new program in the province of Ontario, peer-to-peer -peer emergency department physicians being able to phone a friend and talk through issues. That has ensured that people actually have access when they need it. We now have in Northern Ontario physicians who are in our emergency departments having access to other physicians who have practiced for longer and are able to walk through specific issues. That one change alone has ensured that we have had no physician shortages or, or issues in Northern Ontario. Those are the kinds of policy changes that are actually uh, being suggested by our hospital partners and making an impact Response. in our communities. The final supplementary. Phone a friend speaker? That's their fix? Are you kidding me? That is cold comfort for all of those people out there, thousands of them, whose emergency rooms and clinics have closed. 2.2 million Ontarians who don't have access to primary care. The newly renovated Mindamoya Hospital had to close because this government didn't fund the staff to keep it open. Hospitals and long-term care homes are being gouged by private staffing agencies taking over our health care system. Perth and Smith Falls Hospital was forced to spend a whopping $2.8 million this year on temporary staff through private agencies. I've talked to uh, local hospitals uh, in northern communities who are worried about making payroll. Speaker, we need investment to finally address these staffing shortages. Will the Premier stand up and commit new <laughs> hospital funding to ensure care is available and the patients of Ontario need it? Mr. Pell. Where was the party opposite when we actually announced through our last budget an expansion of primary care? They voted against it. Where was the party opposite when we have made investments and made announcements of over 50 new capital expansions, whether those are new builds in Niagara South, whether those are expansions 
in communities across Ontario. Where was the party opposite the NDP? They voted against it. We'll continue to make those investments. Order. We, in last year's budget alone, we had an average increase in our hospital budgets of 4 per cent. Those are the changes that we make as a government to make sure that our hospitals and our community system is robust and there for us when we need it. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this question is again for the Premier. The government's announcement to shut down the Ontario Science Centre and lay off staff and reopen it in a new building half its size is very, very unpopular, especially for people in some of the most impacted neighbourhoods like Thorncliff Park and uh, Flemington Park. It's a decision that also, Speaker, doesn't make a lot of sense to most people. Uh, the official oppos opposition NDP, we've unearthed yet another secret government document uh, that's called Ontario Science Centre Modernization relocation plans. Very interesting. But what's really notable about this document is the date, August 27, 2021. Speaker, why did the Premier keep his plans for the Science Centre a secret during the 2022 election? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for the leader for the question. Uh, I got this feeling that the word tourism is a bad word. We're, we're no, talking about. We're ta no, hang on for a second. Tourism represents almost 36 million or billion in economic activity. Just under 400,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, and 82,000 business-related jobs and careers in tourism. Yet we talk about an opportunity, a destination. Tourism is about finding a place to go, drawing people in, not just people in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but people across Canada and maybe into the United Foreign. States. Yes. It's driving tourism, Mr. Speaker. A destination is important, whether it's a spa, common areas, water parks, paddling, walking and being casual in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area where you can sit Response. and be quiet. All these great things that, you know what, tourists like, Mr. Speaker, they want to come to, they want to come here. We're making a destination a world-class destination, Mr. Here. Speaker. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, um, the uh, FOI secret documents that we've unearthed clearly show that the Premier had already made a decision to move the Ontario Science Centre to Ontario Place nearly two years before he told the public. <laughs> Uh, we also know it wasn't until later that year that the government commissioned their business case that would justify a decision the Premier had already apparently made. That business case was withheld from the public for another eight months, despite repeated requests from opposition members to make it public. So, Speaker, to the Premier, why should the public trust a Premier who clearly believes in decision-based evidence-making instead of evidence-based decision-making? The response, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As they say, two cases are better than one. Um, two business cases that suggest that this is a wonderful opportunity. Opportunity that we'd like to think we want to explore for the people of Ontario. But more importantly, again, back to that tourism word that everyone, or not everyone, just certain people don't seem to like. Those guys. We talk about building up opportunity in Ontario, Order. in jobs and careers destinations, making an Ontario place that people want to come to visit and stay maybe an extra day or two longer because the destination is so special and the opportunity is an experience that those people and their families want to experience, Mr. Speaker. That's what tourism is about. People in Ontario do a fabulous job. Those working in the industry are doing a, a better job because of COVID. They're smarter. They Response. are ready. And they want to people to come to Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They want them to visit. They want them to stay. We want to welcome people. Yes. Final supplementary. Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier, but can I just say, I mean, if this was such a great idea, why did they work so hard to keep it secret for so long? I, I don't I don't buy it. I don't buy it, and I don't think the people of 
Ontario by it. They know there's something dirty about this deal. Earlier this year, Speaker, the NDP released an FOI uh, secret document showing that the government had already decided to pay for a new parking garage for Therma as early as January 2021, nearly two years again before the public found out. We know they planned to move the Science Centre also nearly two years before the public found out. Speaker, we can wait for the Auditor General's report tomorrow or the Premier can set the record straight right now. Is he building a half-sized science centre on top of the Therma parking garage to justify spending $650 million public dollars on a private luxury spa? Caution the Leader of the Opposition on her choice of words. Response, Minister. Uh, Speaker, thank you for the question. Uh, the Science Centre. Um, you know, it's, it's a fabulous place, and they talk about space, Mr. Speaker. And though I, I wasn't in the business of real estate and development and designing, I do know that there's something called common area, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about space. In common area is that area in a building that people move through, that they don't necessarily stop and wait, but they move through, and it's part of the design. And the existing Science Centre has fabulous and large common space areas. Well, the new Science Centre will not have that much common space because it'll be more efficient, more directed, more targeted to exhibits. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, that's what the Science Centre is about, drawing people in, educating them, creating, a, dare I say it again, an experience. Don't worry about the common area. Worry about what they come to see, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Those are the displays. Those are what's Spots. out there for people to learn from, not hallways, exhibition space. Here, here, here. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, I will just say, not all kids have backyards or great big spaces to run around in. And children who live in apartment buildings, they deserve to have space too, right? Why not? Give me a break. Speaker, while this government is bu busy planning, uh, Speaker, while Order. this government is busy planning for a luxury spa in downtown Toronto, the people of Brampton are facing property tax increases up to 34% next year. Wild. That's because the government's plan to dissolve Peel Region is estimated to cost the city of Brampton more than $1.3 billion. Speaker. So I'm going to ask the Premier, how can he justify the largest tax hike in Brampton's history in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Government House. I can say this. Uh, the government is continuously focused on reducing taxes, uh, building more homes. It has been at the core of what we have been doing since 2018, and we will certainly never allow a community to raise uh, uh, raise taxes so that the people in that community can't afford to live there. It is only really the leader of the opposition who is consistently talking about increasing taxes on the people of the province of Ontario. When we've reduced it, when we've reduced taxes, she's actually voted against those reductions. Look, it was so bad that when we reduced taxes on the lowest income earning Ontarians, virtually removing them from paying the responsibility of paying taxes, the NDP actually voted against that because at the core at the core of what the NDP believe, Mr. Speaker, is that people have to be dependent on government. We believe you give the people Spons. the tools to succeed, and they will do just that. They will succeed, and we will continue on that mission, Mr. Speaker, because the job's not done. And the supplementary question. Speaker. This deal between the Premier and the new uh, Liberal leader is going to make life more expensive for 1.5 million people in Peel, over 600,000 of them in Brampton alone. People still don't know how their public services are going to be impacted, but what they do know is that thanks to this Conservative Liberal deal, their taxes are going up and up and up. So back to the Premier of this province, what does he have to say to the people of Brampton about their 34 per cent tax hike? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
Speaker, I'll say this uh, to the people of Brampton. I am very, very confident that there will not be a 34 per cent property tax hike, unless, of course, unless, of course, there is an NDP council or an NDP mayor. Or, then all bets are off, Mr. Speaker, because we know the history of the NDP. It's the same old song they're singing. It is a party that's against the 413. We're virtually not virtually, we're wiped out of Brampton, Mr. Speaker, because they are so old school. They're against development, they're against people, they're against business. They're singing the same old tune over and over and over again, Mr. Speaker. This is a party that has no ideas. Their time in opposition is, even their time in opposition is starting to come to an end, colleagues, because they are so bankrupt of ideas. So, Mr. Speaker, we've created thousands of jobs Response. across the province of Ontario. We've cut taxes. We've made investments in all of the important areas for the people of the province of Ontario. Consistently, they have voted against. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. What a great minister. Under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, when global companies were considering locations to expand in, Ontario was never on the short list. Right. Businesses did not want to navigate through mazes of red tape while paying tax hike after tax hike. When we came into office, we immediately took action to scrap the Liberal NDP agenda of tax hikes and red tape. Now, Ontario is the first place that comes to mind when companies want to invest and expand. By creating the conditions for businesses to succeed, we've seen record investments and job growth across the entire province of Ontario. Speaker, can the minister highlight some of the recent investments that Ontario has welcomed? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Well, we were at the opening of Kanos. It's a IT company from Ireland just yesterday they announced and we did the ribbon cutting at their plant or at their facility in downtown toronto 100 employees on their way up to hiring 300 employees again all because we have lowered the cost of doing business in ontario we graduate 65,000 stem grads each and every year welcome kanos and the 100 employees that they brought the week before uh, we welcomed unilever to downtown toronto they're from the UK, obviously. They are open. They have opened their world's first and only AI lab right here in Ontario, right here in Toronto. We competed with 50 countries around the world to attract Unilever here, and we Response. won. They have several hundred employees that uh, uh, will be employed here at their downtown op operation in Toronto. So, Speaker, uh, we're, we're very grateful. Thank you. And the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. You would think that with more than 700,000 jobs created since we took office, the Liberals and the NDP would realize that our approach of lower costs works. But instead, they continue to advocate for policies that would crush businesses, Shame. penalize workers, and destroy our economy. Shame. While we have been laser-focused on creating jobs and growing the economy, the Liberals spent the last six months just to end up with a new leader who endorses the same anti-growth agenda as the NDP. By reducing the annual cost of doing businesses by $8 billion annually and cutting burdensome red tape, we have seen job-creating investments flood into the province of Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on other investments that and sure. expansions Ontario has secured over the past few months? Thank you. Economic development, job creation, and trade. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, last week alone, we had several hundred million dollars in new investment. Heddle Shipyards is investing 107 million dollars in St. Catharines so they can tackle the Vessel Life Extension project. That's 30 new jobs, $3.4 million in support through our government's AMIC uh, 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 operation. Medicom, $165 million investment in London. This is a 140,000 square foot production facility that's being built, 135 new jobs coming. 
If you remember before the pandemic, Speaker, we made virtually no PPE here in Ontario. Today, we make 74 percent of the PPE we buy. Once Medicom is up and running, making nitrile gloves here in Ontario, 92 percent of all PPE that we buy will be made domestically right here in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government decided that the Luxury Spa Act, Bill 154, won't be going to committee or have any more time in this legislature, but folks have real concerns. In this bill, the Minister of Infrastructure is being gifted the power to issue minister zoning orders. Ontarians see that MZOs are a government gift for their insiders to fast-pass process. MZOs don't get shovels in the ground faster. They often don't have community buy-in, but they do make some people stink and rich. So my question is, now that the Minister of Infrastructure has the power to issue MZOs, who is going to get rich next? Thank you. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, well uh, Mr. Speaker, I tell you what's going to happen, and what has continuously happened in the province of Ontario, is that the people of the province of Ontario continue to prosper because of the uh, policies of this government. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade just talked about a massive investment that is coming to Ontario. This is on top of $27 billion dollars worth of other investments. We all know that when they had the opportunity, they literally drove out the auto sector. You remember that? The auto sector was gone. They were transitioning to a service economy. We said that we're going to reinvest, bring jobs back to the province of Ontario. So the member asked who's going to prosper, the people of the province of Ontario to continue to prosper. Ontario Place will bring thousands of jobs. It'll bring thousands of tourists from all over the uh, all over uh, Ontario, all over the United States, Mr. Speaker, it is a destination that we should continue to be proud of. But unfortunately, under the Liberal and NDPs, they allowed that destination to crumble. We're bringing it back to life, just as we brought it to life when Bill Davis was the premier. We're going to bring it back to life and make it even better than before. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is back to the premier. Ontario Place is a public outdoor treasure globally recognized for its heritage. Because of Bill 154, neither the Environmental Assessment Act nor the Heritage Act will apply. Because of Bill 154, this PC government will be allowed to break the laws with impunity. Because of Bill 154, the Minister of Infrastructure now gets to issue MZOs. She also gets a fancy schmancy luxury spa as her legacy project. Speaker, we saw preferential treatment and MZOs given out as party favours by the previous Minister of Housing. So my question to the Premier is, who gets the first MZO? from the Minister of Megaspas, and where did they get to sit at the wedding? <laughs> Members will take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I tell you, Speaker, this is a party. This is a party that is virtually being wiped out one member at a time, right? They fight, they're fighting with Order. themselves. So I tell Order. you what's happening, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know who's going to get new things? The city of Toronto is going to get new buses and trains because of the deal. That's what's going to happen. Our streets will be safer. Our buses will, and our transit uh, uh, system Order. will be safer because of this deal. We will revitalize a, a destination that she calls a jewel. We're actually going to revitalize it so people want to come back to it, Mr. Exactly. Speaker. Thousands of jobs will be created by this. So who's going to prosper? The people of the province of Ontario will prosper. It is a gift for all of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I know the member has weddings on her mind. She was just married recently. I congratulate her for that, Mr. Speaker. I think we all do. But it really highlights. It highlights Response. the problem of today's NDP, right? They stand for nothing. They're angry at each other, they're angry at the province, they're angry at the people, and that is why they keep losing election after election after election. The next question. Order. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Our government was elected with a strong mandate to serve the people of Ontario. After years of neglect and disrespect from the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, Ontarians support us to make decisions that will make life better for everyone. This includes taking leadership to address affordability concerns and ensuring that our health care system receives the support that it requires. Unfortunately, our hospitals are having to deal with unnecessary rising operational costs 
thanks to increasing federal taxes, rising interest rates, and ongoing international supply chain issues. Hospitals across Ontario should be able to focus their resources on providing frontline services, not on taxes and red tape. Speaker, could the minister please inform the legislature about how rising costs from increasing federal taxes are negatively impacting our hospitals? The Premier and Minister of Health. To the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for raising this very important issue. You know, since the federal government imposed a carbon tax, the financial burden is already making an impact on hospitals across Ontario. The federal government's carbon tax will impact Ontario's hospitals by increasing annual heating costs by 27.2 million dollars for 2022. So, what would that 27.2 million dollars bond purchase? It would have offered an additional. 104,615 MRI operating hours providing scans for an additional 157 patients. These are real issues that are impacting our hospital partners and, of course, our patients. That's why our government will continue fighting the federal government's carbon tax on behalf of the people of Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. While our government is advocating for all Ontarians, the opposition NDP and Liberals are oblivious to the far-reaching negative impacts that higher taxes and burdensome red tape are causing, among many other things they're oblivious to. When it comes to accessing specialized health care services, there are times when residents in Northern Ontario need to travel to other parts of our province. I know that many of my constituents rely on vital programs like the Northern Travel Grant that help offset tra long-distance travel costs. While with costs for fuel and accommodation continuing to Order. rise, it is not right or fair that residents in the North should have to endure these additional expenses just because they need medical care and services. Speaker, can the minister please explain how increasing taxes and burdensome red tape are negatively impacting the Question. people of Northern Ontario? The Minister of Health. And I will say the member is raising a very important issue that is actually costing uh, all Ontario residents, but particularly our northern residents, to fill the car, heat your home, and feed your family. Even though our government is always looking at ways to make life more affordable, including looking at changes to the Northern Travel Grant to ensure it continues to serve Northerners in a way that is, that is convenient and effective. We know the federal government is making the travel more expensive. Over the last number of months, we have demonstrated the real cost of the federal gar carbon tax on families, on students, seniors, and on our institutions and services the people of Ontario come to rely on. We call on members from across the aisles to join us in demanding the federal government repeal this tax that is disproportionately Response. impacting Northern Ontario. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When asked for an update on the Eglinton Crosstown Public-Private Partnership, Metrolink CEO Phil Verster essentially said he would let the public know when he knows. After a decade under construction and over a billion dollars over budget, this response from Mr. Verster is unacceptable. What is it going to take to fire Mr. Verster? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government has launched the largest expansion of public transit in the history of this province. Mr. Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals have voted against it every step of the way. Mr. Speaker, let's look at the Ontario line. 28,000 cars being taken off the road, and what do the NDP do? They vote against that, Mr. Speaker. We were just announcing a milestone on the Young North subway extension just this past Friday, another large milestone of making sure we get shovels in the ground. That, that project will reduce travel time by 22 minutes, Mr. Speaker, but it will also put over 26,000 people 10 minutes walking distance to a transit station, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have built an incredible $70 billion Spons. program to support public transit across this province. It's about time that the NDP support that plan. A supplementary question. Mr. Verster, and you as Minister of Transportation, who's paying him a million dollars a year, 
have had multiple chances to explain significant operational failures. For the tens of thousands of people whose daily lives are disrupted and the hundreds of small businesses who have been forced to shut down, Mr. Verster's response is an insult. Is this government so incompetent that you cannot recognize massive failure, or do you really like Mr. Verster that much? I remind the members to make their comments to the chair. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Transportation can reply. Mr. Speaker, the NDP have had multiple opportunities to support public transit in this province, and they have said no every single time, Mr. Speaker. On one hand, they want the highest they want to support the Liberals and the highest carbon tax. On the other hand, they don't want to support $70 billion of public investment into transit. They've got to pick a side. Like the House Leader said, they stand for absolutely nothing. When we're taking cars off the road on the Ontario Line, 28,000 cars off the road, on the Eglinton West uh, LRT extension, taking 6.5 fewer trips, 6.5 million fewer trips uh, uh, in your cars. And what do Order. the NDP do to that? They vote against that every single time. Highest carbon tax from the NDP, no investment in public transit. They vote against it every single time under the leadership of Premier Ford. We will build highways, we will build roads, we will build subways, and we'll build LRTs and change the transportation network across this. Members will please take their seats. Order. Order. The House will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The government House Leader will come to order. I think we're ready to start again. Start the clock. The member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. Every day we hear from people who are struggling to find a home. And when this government isn't busy blaming this province's challenges on other levels of government, we hear them talk and talk about a promise to build housing. But, Speaker, just like they broke their promise to protect the Greenbelt, leading to the $8.3 billion Greenbelt scandal for, for which they're now under RCMP criminal investigation, just like they broke their promise to lower income taxes for middle-income families, they're breaking their promise to get housing built. Speaker, they promised to build 1.5 million homes by 2031, but the current forecast is they will get just 870,000 houses built by then. And to date, cities have received more support from the federal government than through this government's Building Faster Fund. My question to the Premier, when will he admit to the people of Ontario question. that once again he has broken his promise to them and that his housing plan is failing? And to reply, the Premier. Maybe you should go talk to your new leader. The number one concern for their new leader is let's raise a million dollars because someone has to pay for my salary. That's what her number one issue was. That shows me you picked the wrong leader. Maybe you should pick the guy in the far back instead of that leader. Number, number one issue. Just a sec, just a sec. We stopped the clock. The Premier, Premier, Premier. I had to stop the clock because I couldn't hear you. So just a second. House will come to order. Order. Okay. Order. Restart the clock. The Premier has the floor. Your leader has the worst record in Ontario on building homes, and you have the nerve to say about building homes, again, maybe you should sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart with, your, with your leader. She was against building the 413, that is critical, to Brampton and Mississauga. She was against the carbon tax. She was for the carbon tax for 15 years. She was all in favour of taxing people. 
She raised taxes in Mississauga, unprecedented Response. heights. That's, that's what your leader's about. We're about lowering taxes, building the 413, getting rid of the carbon tax, and building more. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House at each other. Order. Order. <coughs> Let's restart the clock. Don Valley West, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Clearly, the Premier is worked up about our new leader, as he should be. Ontario Liberals are incredibly proud of our new leader. Order. A big city mayor and former MP, Bonnie Order. Crombie has a great deal of experience working to improve the lives of Ontarians, not just their, like this government working to Order. help their insider friends. She's getting new developments approved. Mississauga, once considered a suburb, has been transformed under her leadership into a full-fledged metropolis. In fact, last year, the city of Mississauga issued a record number of building permits, and the city currently ranks fourth in the continent for the number of construction cranes. To imply Order. that housing construction is in decline because of mayors like Bonnie Crombie is not only disingenuous but deeply disappointing. Building 1.5. <sighs> I'm going to ask the member for Don Valley West to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Drawn. Include her question. Building 1.5 million new homes requires something akin to a wartime effort. It requires cooperation with civil society and other levels of government. We cannot and should not be kneecapping them. Speaker, once again to the Premier, when will he admit his housing plan is not working and start working with, not against, our municipal partners to get the housing crisis solved? And the Premier? Again, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, this is a leader that said no to removing tolls, no to scrapping the license plate stickers, no to cutting taxes. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because their leader was too busy flying around in the private jet of her buddy, the developer, that everyone knows who this developer is and is going to come back to haunt her, flying around in the private jet, going to her $5 million estate in the Hamptons. She's out of touch with the average person. The next question. Order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the President of the Treasury Board. In the past year, we've seen emergencies like wildfires, floods, and storms in all parts of Ontario. The people in my riding of Burlington and across the province are looking to our province in times of need. It's our responsibility to keep all Ontarians safe in the event of emergencies. We must continue to do all that we can to ensure our province is prepared as much as possible for any urgent situation that may arise. Speaker, can the President of the Treasury Board please share what our government is doing to strengthen emergency management and ensure that Ontario is prepared for the future? The President of the Treasury Board. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Burlington for the question. Simply put, Speaker, there is nothing more important than the safety and the well-being of our families and our loved ones. Our government, through Emergency Management Ontario, supports emergency preparedness and mitigation, and we coordinate response and recovery with our partners, keeping the more than 15 million people in Ontario safe. This is a 24-7, 365-day-a-year job, and I am so proud and grateful of, to all the dedicated emergency responders and personnel who do it. I'm pleased that our government has earmarked a $110 million investment to strengthen emergency management and to make Ontario even more safe and more prepared. And I'll have more to say about those investments in the supplementary. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. It's encouraging to see our government demonstrate leadership in protecting the well-being of our families and our loved ones. The people of this province, including my constituents in Burlington, will be pleased to know that our government is taking every necessary step to keep them safe. The President of the Treasury Board spoke about the $110 million emergency management support we outlined in our last budget. Speaker, can the Minister please explain how our government is spearheading a comprehensive emergency management plan and safeguarding our province through this investment. The President of the Treasury Board. And again, thank you to the member for the question and for the opportunity to speak about the important investments that our government is making. One of the ways our government is ensuring that Ontario is safe, practiced, and prepared is the Community Emergency Preparedness Grant. This new grant will help communities purchase critical emergency equipment and supplies, such as sandbagging machines or generators or could be invested in emergency management training. This grant is a prudent and a responsible investment that gives communities the tangible resources that they need to keep people safe when the next flood, wildfire, or severe storm impacts our province. I look forward to continuing to work with local levels of government, First Nations communities, and organizations to prepare for emergencies now and in the future. Thank you very much. The next question. The member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Ontario Health Coalition released their report today. Just this year, in the province of Ontario, there has been closures in 868 emergency departments and 316 urgent care centres. These closures are affecting my community at the Douglas Memorial Urgent Care Centre in Fort Erie. Nearly half of the population of Fort Erie is over 55. 8,000 residents do not have a family doctor, and there is no reliable public transit in town. Having an urgent care center open 24-7 can mean the difference between life and death for our residents. Speaker, when is the Premier going to stop fighting nurses in court, repeal Bill 124, mm -hmm. properly fund our public health care system, and ensure, ensure that every community has access to health care they deserve and Question. need when they need it. Thank you. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, I'm, I'm going to again remind the NDP member that as we bring these investments forward, whether it is through the Paul economic statement or our budgets, your party and you vote against them. So when we make changes legislatively for as of right that allows physicians who wish to practice in the province of Ontario to quickly do that without having to wait for their license to be transferred, the member opposite votes against that legislation. When we have capital investments of over 50 new expanded, renovated hospitals, including, of course, in his own area with the South Niagara Hospital, you vote against it. Now, I will say, you do show up for the photo op, but you vote against it Order. when you have an opportunity to make a difference in Response. your community. That's model. your legacy. Dan, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. The Ontario Health Coalition was able to identify 1,199 vital hospital services closure. That's 868 ER, 316 urgent care closure, 11 obstetric closure, labor and delivery closure, ICU closure, lab closure. Every single one of these closures puts people's health and lives at risk. The minister must be very proud. Her plan to create a crisis is working perfect. How many more private clinics will the minister be able to fund given this level of crisis? Members will take their seats. Minister Bell. Speaker, I think it's important to remind the member opposite that, in fact, these were numbers that had never been managed and measured previously. There was no provincial government that was accessing and ensuring that hospitals made sure that data was here. And frankly, you cannot man manage what you don't measure. We're measuring those changes, and you know, I, I have to say the investments that we continue to make, whether it is a 50-bed rehab expansion, 
in in uh, in Sudbury uh, at Health Science North, whether it is a 72-bed expansion at St. Joe's. Again, where was the NDP party? They were voting against these investments in their own community, Order. where, again, they will show up for the photo op, but when they can make a difference in their community and support those changes and investments, they vote against it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. There's nothing the people of Caledonia want more for Christmas than to hear the reconstruction of the Argyle Street Bridge will begin. I promise this House I will rise on this matter until shovels are in the ground. This is my fourth question related to the bridge since August 2022. A few weeks ago, I sat in traffic in the middle of the bridge when the sound of sirens was heard. An ambulance was attempting to get across. Cars had nowhere to go. The paramedic was clearly frazzled, and people were panicked. This should not be happening on any bridge in this province, and yet it's happening on a daily basis in Caledonia for the past few years. People of Haldeman County are fed up, and they are tired of this government's inability to get the job done. So, Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the date the reconstruction of the Argyle Street Bridge will begin? And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, safety is a top priority for this government. Uh, uh, as a Minister of Transportation, uh, we have a budget of over $27 billion uh, to invest in our roads, our highways, uh, and bridges. And I look forward to working with a member. We have made significant progress on that specific project. Uh, we appreciate the challenges uh, that uh, uh, she has uh, mentioned, and we are working uh, with uh, the uh, appropriate partners to ensure that that uh, project is well under its uh, well underway, Mr. Speaker. But Unlike the Liberals and NDP, our government is committed to making sure that we're building highways, we're building roads, we're investing in our bridges across this province. $27 billion uh, in our budget, Mr. Speaker, over the next 10 years, which both the Liberals and NDP have voted against every single time. And the supplementary question. Now, thank you, Speaker. There we have it. No Christmas miracle in Caledonia this year. But rather more excuses that don't hold any weight. The progress. I'd like to know what that progress, did, progress is. The ministry, they kicked Lori Harcourt from her home, the toll house, in 2019. She could still be living in her home that she spent 35 years redoing. The lack of an answer leads me to question what it is holding up the reconstruction, and why doesn't the minister just tell us? The people of Caledonia, they're good people, and they deserve a good reason. And maybe they'd be sympathetic if they actually knew what that reason was. But as I warned the previous minister, many fear the bridge is at risk of collapse. No government, no minister wants that on their hands. So, Speaker, through you to the minister, could he clearly articulate why he's taking this risk and what it is that is preventing the reconstruction of the bridge? The Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker. We understand and appreciate that there are challenges across this province, but we have made a commitment to support investments, unlike the previous Liberal government for 15 years, did absolutely nothing to support uh, bridges and highways across this province, Mr. Speaker. We are saying yes to investing in rural communities across the province, including the Argyle Bridge. With the with the new five-span steel arc bridge, Mr. Speaker, the design of the bridge replacement is complete, and our government is in the process of obtaining final approver, approvals to proceed with construction, Mr. Speaker. But thanks to the Premier, our, the leadership of, of uh, this government, we're investing in our roads, we're investing in our bridges, $27 billion, and that project will be a part of those investments, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately. Uh, the previous Liberal government had 15 years and did absolutely nothing with their infrastructure, but we're going to continue to make sure we make the necessary investments, build bridges, build roads, build highways, and build transit across this province. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Our government, our government recently announced the introduction of Bill 157, the Enhancing Access to Justice Act 2023. This proposed legislation contains several pivotal changes, including amendments to the Coroner's Act. Uh, the Coroner's Act currently requires a mandatory inquest for each construction-related death, and Bill 197 will introduce the creation of a coroner-led annual review and public reports 
report of multiple accidental construction-related deaths each year. These changes highlight our government's commitment to the safety and well-being of our workers. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how the proposed amendments to the Coroner's Act will allow for faster and more meaningful recommendations for construction-related death investigations? To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague from Thornhill for the question. Any death, Mr. Speaker, is too many. Public safety is paramount, and our government is committed to exploring any option that may prevent further deaths. And that's why my friend and colleague, the Attorney General, introduced Bill 157. And the member's right. The Coroner's Act currently requires a mandatory inquest for each construction-related death. Our proposed change would require an annual coroner-led review of accidental deaths that occur at or in constru construction projects in the previous year. Mr. Speaker, the main intent of the proposed amendment to the Coroner's Act is to prevent further deaths in the industry by reviewing construction-related uh, trends and sector-wide issues and make recommendations that can be identified faster. Mandatory annual Response. review of construction-related deaths will lead to quicker justice. And in the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, a safe Ontario is a strong Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for his response. It's reassuring to hear that our government is going to make the process easier and quicker for families. Losing a loved one is a tragedy and one of the most terrible things to happen to a family. Anyone who has lost a member of their family in an accident reserves and deserves the right to an inquest and to be a part of the process. It is of critical importance that our government provide Ontario families with assurance in upholding their right to an inquest. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please tell the House how the proposed changes to Bill 197 will help bring justice to families? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thanking the member from Thornhill. And the member's right. The death of a loved one is the most terrible thing that can happen to any family. Our hearts go out to the families who lost a spouse, and a sibling, a child, or a parent. And I agree that the families need to have the right to request an inquest if necessary, and that is provided in Bill 157. Their request for an inquest will be reasonably considered by the coroner. The proposed change for Bill 157 Order. will make the delivery of the facts for families that much more quicker. Mr. Speaker, these amendments would streamline the process, bringing justice to families in an expedited manner. Order. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, our government will always be there for our workers, the workers that helped build Ontario every single day, that keep Order. us safe. We will always have their backs. The next question, the member for University, Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Desjardins Credit Union just released a report showing short-term rentals are having a negative impact on housing affordability. The report found that neighbourhoods with a lot of short-term rental listings see their rents rise faster, have lower vacancy rates and higher home sale prices. To increase the number of homes available for long-term rentals, Desjardins is calling for governments to crack down on short-term rentals in investment properties. My question is this, can you move forward on this simple request? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, let me just say this. Uh, I, uh, I too have, uh, uh, have concerns uh, with that, uh, Speaker, uh, but at the, uh, at the same time, uh, as we know, coming out of COVID, there are a number of, uh, of challenges that we uh, faced, uh, in particular with respect to the, uh, the landlord uh, tenant board. That is why we put significant resources behind ensuring that we could catch up. I'm fully aware of the fact that in many instances, uh, people have turned to the short term market because of, uh, uh, of the, the challenges uh, with the landlord tenant board. As the member will know, though, the Attorney General has put significant resources into ensuring that we can bring the case backlog up to date. Principally, uh, many of these uh, delays 
uh, were as a result, of, as you will recall, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, uh, we weren't allowing uh, uh, evictions during that time period. We were ensuring that people could stay uh, uh, in their in their rental homes. But it's also about additional supply, and that's why we're so focused on building more. 15,000 starts, but but I do share the, the members' concerns. I am concerned about that, but I think we have to put in the climate to ensure that people who are in the short-term market feel confident about getting back into the rental market. Supplementary. Well, when we're thinking about rental enforcement, that's, that just perfectly relates to my second question. Back to the printer, um, Premier. Justin is a University of Toronto student living in downtown Toronto. When his apartment was bought by a U.S. investor landlord, he became a victim of illegal harassment to drive himself and his neighbours out of their homes. When his neighbours have given up and moved out, their landlord turns their homes into pricey short-term rentals where you can rent out one bedroom in an apartment by the week. That is the new reality for students in Toronto today. Justin and his neighbours have called provincial bylaw officers begging for help, and no one has returned their call. Can this government work with these tenants to enforce our rental laws? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I think that really high level I, I think the, the real problem there is that that students have uh, they don't have the ability in, in many instances to live on campuses we've seen uh, uh, in many communities across the province of Ontario that they have been frustrating uh, uh, the ability of our colleges and universities to build student housing on their campuses is one of the reasons why that we have said uh, in the new year we're going to double down to make sure that we work with our partners in that sector so that we can get more student housing uh, uh, housing built uh, it is absolutely it is absolutely vital uh, that we do that, Mr. Speaker, and as I said, we will double down to make sure that we can get that accomplished. Thank you. Next question, the me member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Ontario is experiencing a historic labour shortages. There are currently about 300,000 unfilled jobs across Ontario, and many of these vacancies are in skilled trades. Our government must continue to show leadership and take action by working with employers and unions to encourage more people to enter the skilled trades. By the year 2025, it is projected that about one in five jobs opening will be in the skilled trades. That's why urgent action is needed now more than ever. In the next decade alone, Ontario will need over 100,000 more people in the construction industry only. Question. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to address labour shortages in the skilled trades? The uh, parliamentary assistant, member for Mississauga, Malton. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, uh, Mississauga Iron Mills for the important question. Our government is on a mission to help our people enter skilled trades. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we are making historic investment to show our young people that these careers are one they can be proud of. The minister was recently in Mississauga, joined with the wonderful Minister of Education to visit our latest Level Up Skill Trade Fair. Across the province, more than 28,000 young people, parents, educators attended our fairs last year, getting hands-on experience in Ontario's 144 trades. I'm proud to say that under the leadership of this Premier, we are seeing an increase in the number of apprentices signing up across the province, up 24 per cent last year alone wow. Wow. to the workers of Ontario. We will continue to work with our partners in the Response. industry. We will continue to make investments to fix the system and help more people find good paying jobs. Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is reassuring to hear that the skilled trades career fairs for our students are having such a positive impact on our young people. However, while we continue to see more young people taking an interest in entering the skilled trades, it is also concerning the fact that women are significantly underrepresented in the, in the sector. Given the critical labour shortage, shortages, what we are encountering 
our government must address barriers that are creating challenges for women to enter the skilled trades. That's why our government must do all that we can to, to empower the next generation to explore these careers. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please Question. explain what our government is doing to break down barriers for women entering careers in skilled trades and construction industry? Again, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you to the member again for that wonderful question. Mr. Speaker, our government has been clear since day one, women belong on shop floors and construction sites just as much as men. Full stop. Actions speak louder than words. We have made investment to support the training and retraining of women in the workforce, whether it is 650,000 to introduce to the electrical trade, million dollar to goodwill amity program, 225,000 to the accelerator career program, 700,000 for the digital project program, and many more. Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, the government mandated employers must provide women on the construction site personal protective equipment that fits them properly. The steps we are taking are making a difference. We have seen almost 30% increase in women signing up for the apprenticeship. Mr. Speaker, Response. Minister sat with Natasha Ferguson, a young black woman who overcome these biases under the leadership of this premier. We are breaking down barriers and working for our workers. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker, uh, Speaker uh, to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, uh, the cost of living in the North is very high. Uh, a 2016 report stated that uh, First Nation families in Northern Ontario spend more than half of their income on groceries to meet the basic nutritional requirements. Speaker, uh, last summer I visited uh, Kiwewin First Nation and I met uh, April McKay, who has a community garden that gives fresh, uh, that uh, provides fresh produce to Kiwewin. Uh, speaker, is there any way that this government can help other people across, across the north like April who want to create community gardens and improve food security? Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank the member for this question and for the evolving discussion we've had on this topic. Uh, it's important that we recognize over the past couple of weeks some of those cost drivers, the carbon tax, etc. But having lived in the isolated communities, there's no question that food is very expensive, Mr. Speaker. And that doesn't just go to the cost of the food, it goes to the nutritional standards uh, for the people living in those communities. And so the short answer is absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Food security is ready to, to, to move forward. The Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is already supporting communities like Yabmatum First Nation, Niskandiga and Martin Falls have called for this. We have new partnerships at the University of Guelph and a great discussion with the Minister of Agriculture about how we can put these pieces together, provide the capacity to build community gardens, micro-farming and other kinds Response. of techniques, vertical growing, so that that kind of nutritional food can be built potentially year-round in those isolated communities. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, Speaker, uh, in line with the, uh, when we talk about the cost of living on a First Nation, it is about 25% higher than the rest of the country. Um, this past summer, I, I visited Webekwe, and uh, Speaker, the price of gas was $4.59 per litre. But the few experts tell me that it cost $2.50 per litre delivered, whether by truck or airplane. Speaker, uh, what is this government doing for the people in the north who need affordable gas for subsistence hunting and fishing? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. I thought we were going to continue talking about food security. That throws me for a bit of a loop. I mean, we have reduced the fuel surcharge on planes flying into the isolated communities. Of course, we continue to strenuously oppose uh, the carbon tax, which is going to continue to drive the cost of gas up. I'm not sure what the member's opinion is, Mr. Speaker, but I can guarantee him 
uh, that, Mr. Speaker, that we will continue to focus on reducing costs for isolated and remote communities. Turning back to food security for a moment, Mr. Speaker, next week I'll be attending a conference and an MOU signing with uh, Kekenomaga, Kekenjagewan Employment Training Services, the Meshkigiwak Tribal Council, Sulukout Area Management Board, Kiwetnakoki Mackinac, and the Island Lake communities from Manitoba who will converge to sign a memorandum of understanding, Mr. Speaker, to consolidate Response. their food purchasing partners. Uh, uh, power and to explore options to grow food in their old community in their own communities. I'm going to be there, Mr. Speaker, because this is important for nutrition and affordability for isolated communities. Concludes our question period. A couple of members have informed me they have points of order, but before we do that, I beg to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 9G, the clerk has received written notice from the government house leader indicating that a temporary change in the weekly meeting schedule of the House is required, and therefore the afternoon routine on Wednesday, December 6, 2023, shall commence at 1 p.m. Point of order. First, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce a few people from my riding. Uh, Heather Kelly from Fort Erie, Lisa Bull from St. Catharines, who's in Jenny's riding, Sue Hott from Niagara. They're from the Niagara Health Coalition. I'd also like to welcome everybody from the Health Coalition that has come from across uh, the province of Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Minister of Education has a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to encourage all parliamentarians to join us for the celebration of the 10th anniversary of the award-winning Tour for Humanity bus by the Friends of Samuel Wiesenthal Centre for Holocaust Studies. The bus is here at Queen's Park. There's a reception during lunch between 12 and 1. You are all encouraged to join us in room 228 as we celebrate the launch of Holocaust Education Ontario. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have a deferred vote on the amendment to the amendment to Government Notice of Motion Number 20 relating to allocation of time on Bill 136, Bill 150, and Bill 154. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. 